Walter Scheidel is a distinguished historian, teaches at Stanford University, and an expert both in the um, historical and contemporary uh, history of inequality. He's the author of The Great Leveler, a, a book which came out about inequality. Uh, Walter, um, in your historical analysis of inequality, how radical is contemporary economic inequality compared to the past? It depends on what metrics uh, you look at. If you apply the standard measurements like the share of income or wealth held by the richest 1% or uh, what is called the Gini coefficient that measures inequality across society, in the US at least, we are pretty much back to where we were before 1929. And that was really the high point of inequality um, in the US. So by that measure, you could say inequality today in the US is about as high as it has ever been. But of course, at the same time, the US is also much richer than it has ever been. So the poor are less poor in absolute terms, but the richer are even richer uh, than they used to be 100 years ago. How do you think the history of capitalism intersects with the history of inequality? It intersects, but it's not a main driver of inequality. Civilization itself is the main driver, the main creator, determinant of economic inequality. The moment you get uh, agriculture, uh, domestication, states, inheritance systems, and they go back many thousands of years, economic inequality appears in the historical record and keeps getting worse for most of uh, history. So capitalism is in a way only the most recent phase in this development. It picks up where pre-modern societies left off. So you reject the, the Marxist notion that capitalism has somehow profoundly and uniquely compounded the inequalities between rich and poor? Uh, in a way, I do, because by turning people into wage laborers, it certainly has um, uh, reinforced economic inequality. But you see similar inequalities even uh, before and what Marx would have called uh, the feudal mode of production or the slave mode of production. Um, even earlier, if, if you don't use those categories anymore, you can get, go back in time almost as, as far as you like, and you will encounter similar levels of inequality held up by political power asymmetries and held up by the institutions that were in place at the time in terms of property rights, inheritance regimes, fiscal regimes, and so on. Uh, and in your book, The Great Leveler, you do focus on the 1940s and 50s in stressing, particularly in the United States, that that was a period of capitalist history in which inequality was actually radically reduced. Uh, so there's no inevitability between inequality and advanced capitalism. That's true, although it seems that inequality under capitalism or under any regime flourishes in times of stability. And what uh, is special about the 30s with the Great Depression and the first half of the 40s with World War II is that the US experienced very major dislocations. And it's those dislocations that prompted equalizing change by making the rich less rich, by uh, prompting aggressive government intervention in the private sector, by driving up uh, taxes and making the tax system much more progressive. Any number of factors came together in that period uh, that uh, reduced inequality very considerably. But we really had to wait for this, for these dislocations to happen, for inequality to go down. There is no good reason to believe it would otherwise have happened in quite the same way. Uh, Walter, you're an economic primarily rather than a, than a political historian. But I know you've given some thought to the relationship between inequality and democracy. How do you view those two things going or not going together? The standard intuition would be that democratic system should be less tolerant of inequality because the, the median voter, the typical voter, is not rich uh, by definition. So the electorate should enact uh, or support programs that uh, reduce inequality. But um, studies have shown, studies done by political scientists, sociology, 
sociologists that it doesn't really happen quite that way in real life, especially in a two-party system where positions are very polarized and both parties package a lot of different schemes and programs that appeal to different slices of the um, electorate. And what happens in the end is uh, that people's preferences for lower inequality are often trumped quite literally by their preferences for other things, uh, for social issues, uh, ideological issues, any number of things. And the net effect is that democracy is actually a rather blunt tool in delivering a significantly higher equality in the economic sphere. What's happened, Walter, over the last 50 years to transform an economic system, which in historical terms had actually minimalized uh, inequality to one in which it once again is top of the agenda in many ways in, uh, in identifying the ills of society? Um, so you're essentially looking at two different periods after World War II. You have the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, with a lot of uh, regulation that helped strong unions, a uh, growing middle class, all kinds of things uh, that helped uh, keep inequality at bay. And then from the 80s onwards, you get more liberalization, more uh, deregulation, globalization, uh, growth of the financial uh, sector, any number of things that together contribute to rising inequality. Now that went on for quite a while in the 80s, in the 90s, most people did not pay a whole lot of attention to it. It wasn't a very big topic uh, in the media or for, for politicians. And then what happened was 12 years ago, you got the financial crisis, the Great Recession. And that was really the first time that uh, the fact that inequality had been rising so much entered the public consciousness on a large scale and was picked up by the media, it was picked up by activists, uh, by politicians, by academics uh, uh, like me, uh, ultimately. And so for the last decade or so, we have been talking about this topic much more than we had before. And that by itself had been uh, driven, uh, I think to a significant extent by this crisis that we experienced uh, in 2007-8. Walter, one of the most troubling things about your remarkably um, erudite book on inequality in historical terms, you, you've looked pretty much through the history of mankind to understand how we, how we undermine inequality in the great leveler, is you suggest there's only really four ways we've ever done it historically. Perhaps you might go through these, you call them the four horsemen of leveling. I call them the four horsemen of leveling because I was able to identify four distinct uh, factors. Two of them used to operate in pre-modern societies for hundreds and thousands of years. One is the collapse of states, which makes a lot of sense because pre-modern states tend to favor the rich and powerful even more than modern uh, democracies do. And so if state structures, governmental structures unravel, everybody is worse off as a result, but the rich simply have more to lose. And as a result, inequality goes down. That's a very effective means of, of leveling inequality, but also a very undesirable one because of the human suffering connected to it. The other was, and this is a, a timely uh, topic, uh, very major epidemics. If you think back to the Black Death in the late Middle Ages, uh, in, in Europe in particular, a third of the population is carried off by the plague, as many as half of all people in places like England. And as a result, you get a shortage of workers. Uh, labor becomes so scarce that its value increases. The surviving workers can ask for higher wages. And at the same time, there's still the same amount of land. So the rich landowners, uh, their assets are worth less than they used to be. So the rich are less rich and the poor are less poor. And the gap between them closes, at least for as long as the effects of the plague were active. Now, all this changed with modernity. In the 20th century, you get two new horsemen which are closely related. One is mass mobilization warfare, especially in World War II, which are already referred to. And the other is communist revolutions starting in Russia in World War I and then with Mao in China in the context of World War II. And of course, those are movements that are explicitly targeting uh, inequality, trying to get 
uh, rid of, of wealthy people by expropriating them, exiling them, killing them, uh, in many cases having a planned economy, uh, all kinds of uh, features in place that uh, drive down economic inequality to levels you don't ordinarily see in, in free market systems. As a pretty radical and, and dramatic um, fixes to inequality, what about the less dramatic political alternative? The voting into power of a, of a Bernie Sanders or a Jeremy Corbyn and a radical restructuring of tax systems, inheritance taxes uh, outside of revolution. All these things would certainly work if they could actually be implemented. But you mentioned Corbyn, you mentioned Sanders, and they are not, they didn't actually uh, make it this time. And in Britain, you now see a, a return to centrism in, in the Labour Party and the same uh, in, in the Democratic Party um, here. So there has never been a shortage of political platforms of programs advocating all the things that you just listed. And we know economists tell us these things would work. They would reduce economic inequality. But more often than not, they turn out not to be politically feasible, at least not in times of peace and uh, stability. That's essentially what the historical record shows. Uh, one of the one horseman potentially missing is technology. What about the role of, of, of digital technology in perhaps transforming uh, the capitalist system and uh, undermining inequality? Or is digital actually compounding it? I'm inclined to think it's probably compounding um, inequality. I live in Silicon uh, Valley and I'm an eyewitness to this uh, process. All the main beneficiaries are physically located uh, in my immediate neighborhood and they drive down both local and global inequality uh, to even higher levels than before. It is true that technology can improve uh, you know, people's lives in, 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 in significant ways and it may flatten disparities in quality of life uh, inequalities. But if you look at income and wealth, then the digital uh, revolution or arguably any coming technological change is more likely to exacerbate uh, economic inequality than to attenuate it. And of course, I assume the, the role of AI would be the reverse of a pandemic. Uh, it would make That's very labor true, yeah. more and more uh, affordable rather than scarce. Yes, and that's really a continuation of the process of globalization where you would outsource job to lower uh, wage economies. And there are certain jobs you can't easily outsource, but now robots may play uh, the same role and hollow out labor markets um, even further. So what about the coronavirus pandemic, Walter? Um, is that a blessing? Could it be a blessing in disguise in terms of the role of pandemic in um, in, 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 in shattering this deep economic inequality uh, in early 21st century capitalist society? Um, it, of course, it may seem almost frivolous right now to, to refer to it as a, as a possible blessing um, in disguise. It's one thing we know is it's certainly not going to have the same effect as the, the pre-modern uh, epidemics did because the mortality rate is going to be much lower. It's not going to create um, a scarcity um, of labor. So in as much as it is likely to have an effect on inequality in the coming years, it will be by uh, um, destabilizing uh, a political uh, consensus, by influencing the preferences of uh, the electorate in ways that may uh, equalizing reform, equalizing change more likely um, to happen. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the main hope uh, we have that it might lead to such outcomes. And here we face what is almost a, a perverse paradox, which is if history has anything to teach us, it is the worse the crisis turns out to be, the greater the potential for transformative change is likely to be. If this plays out in a similar way as after uh, 2008, that you have a slow but gradual and ongoing recovery, uh, some kind of return to the status quo, I believe, is the most likely outcome with some tweaking at the margins. But if this turns out to be harder to manage because it's hard to find effective vaccines or uh, because we enter some kind of global uh, depression, then really all bets are off and governments may be forced to adopt 
uh, more invasive uh, programs. You may see a socialization, nationalization of healthcare, perhaps uh, even in this uh, country, stronger protection for workers and eventually higher taxes on the rich because someone uh, will have to foot uh, the bill. We can't just create trillions and trillions of dollars out of nowhere and hope this will be fine uh, forever. So, but that really depends on uh, how bad the crisis is going to be. And right now it's really too soon to tell. One of the trends it seems in the last few years has been a shift from democracy to an authoritarian kind of nationalism. You see it in Hungary, in Poland, uh, perhaps in the United States, in India, in Brazil, in the Philippines. Um, in your historical analysis, I know you looked at the 1930s in Europe. Did the history of fascism, Nazism in Germany, fascism throughout much of Europe, particularly in Italy and Eastern Europe, what was the impact of fascism on inequality? Uh, the impact on fascism specifically in, in Germany is that it actually increased um, um, inequality because the the Nazi regime was had an alliance with um, industrialists and essentially um, uh, large segments of the upper classes and made sure that they would uh, benefit especially from from the war economy as it was being uh, ramped up. This was masked, of course, by these mass employment uh, uh, programs for the general uh, population. It was masked to some extent later on during the war by um, exploiting um, occupied territories in other parts of Europe, bringing in slave labor, effectively food and other uh, consumer goods. But if you look at the data, it turns out that economic income, wealth inequality was actually going up uh, in the Nazi period. I'm not sure if we have enough data to say something similar uh, for fascist Italy. So fascism won't work, the pandemic won't work. To quote our old friend Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, what is to be done in terms of inequality, Walter? How do we actually uh, realistically chip away at it? in the early part of the 21st century? What are the best strategies in your view? Assuming, of course, that you think inequality is a bad thing. That, again, is, is something to be um, discussed. I mean, a certain level of inequality is probably desirable. You don't want to live in an economy where there are no incentives. But there's also no doubt that the kind of inequality that currently exists in the US is really out of the ordinary. And we should try to get to levels that are common, let's say, um, in, in, in Western Europe, where you also have free market capitalist economies, but inequality is far less pronounced. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit, especially in a system uh, like the US. It wouldn't take very radical reform to bring down um, inequality. And realistically, we may very well have to settle uh, for incremental change, for change at the margins. Uh, these very uh, sweeping platforms like the Green New Deal. Uh, they sound good. They receive support from a certain percentage uh, of the population, but their chances of being adopted wholesale strike me um, as pretty low, at least for um, as assuming that the current system uh, the, uh, can be maintained uh, the way the establishment is currently trying to do with the, uh, the fixes, the interventions that have been put in place just in the last few weeks, and it will continue to be put in place over the course of this year. Uh, is, the, is there a European model that, that, that is superior in terms of fighting inequality than the US free market, the, or perhaps we might think of it as the Anglo-Saxon model? Uh, yes, there is something like the Anglo-Saxon model because you see similar trends in, in Britain and in Australia in particular, less so perhaps uh, in Canada. And then you have the Western European continental model. People often quote uh, the, the case of Scandinavia, where you have flourishing uh, economies with very low levels of net inequality after taxes and transfers because so much income is being uh, shifted around uh, to benefit the general uh, population, France would be another example, uh, Germany and so on. So there are certainly models out there that would seem to be uh, more appealing where you get a bit of a trade-off between slightly lower growth uh, than in the US, but also significantly lower inequality. The real question is to what extent these models can be imported um, uh, into uh, the rather different environment of the United States. People have been thinking about why is the US so much more unequal historically 
uh, than other countries. And there may be answers we don't like. The U.S. is certainly uh, a, a more diverse uh, a kind of um, society, much more diverse than, let's say, Scandinavia was when it set up uh, a very generous uh, welfare state. That may be an obstacle uh, to higher levels of redistribution. Uh, there are any number of reasons for why such a model might be more difficult uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, implement in the United States than it was in some European countries. So yes, they can serve as a model, but we have to bear in mind it's not all that easy uh, to borrow some of those features. Finally, Walter, you have um, uh, a unique historical vantage point as a, as a, as a historian of, uh, a global historian of inequality. Pick a time and a place where you think uh, it was the best time to live if you, if you hate inequality. What was the best society at what moment in history that actually most effectively dealt with this age-old curse of inequality? It really depends on what kind of inequality you're talking about. If you just focus on economic inequality, inequality in terms of um, income and wealth, and also uh, uh, yeah, education, let's say, um, you know, the, the post-war period was probably uh, the best time we have seen in, in, in history so far, the 50s and 60s. But we mustn't forget that at those times, uh, other, other inequalities that, that we have been chipping away at were much stronger uh, than they are now. Gender inequalities, racial inequalities, discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation. Uh, all those things uh, were uh, much more deeply entrenched at that time. So there was, again, you would have to, uh, to make a choice uh, in a way between lower economic and higher social uh, inequality or the other way around, because it is worth remembering that we have come a long way. There are still uh, very deep structural uh, inequalities in other ways in our society, but they have been going down in terms of gender, in terms of race, by no means uh, enough, but uh, at least there is a certain uh, trajectory uh, in terms of identity, in terms of uh, sexual uh, orientation. Uh, as I said, those inequalities have been going down, and not just in the US, in large parts, um, of the world, and we have, we can reasonably hope uh, this process is going to continue. Whereas economic inequality has really proven much more resilient. It doesn't necessarily move in the same direction as the development uh, of all these other kinds of inequalities. So we can't really pinpoint a single point in time where all these inequalities that bother us were uh, relatively low. Such a time never actually existed.